do that again. If I can track you down again. If I can find you again. We've seen what people do when a woman is abused by a man. Stop. Sit there. Stop. Sit there. You look like a psychotic person. But we wondered, what would happen if we reversed the sexes? What if the victim were a man and the abuser a woman? Huh? You want to start with me? Uh, uh. This time, she plays the aggressor, verbally and physically abusing her boyfriend. How's that? How's that? Women abusing, even assaulting their male partners. Not as isolated as you might think. I hate you! From Moonstruck to Shakespeare in Love to Pirates of the Caribbean, women hitting men may be a Hollywood staple. But it's not just in the movies. Major League pitcher Chuck Finley's wife, actress Tawny Katan, was arrested and briefly jailed after he accused her of pummeling him. She denied it and charges were dropped, but only after she agreed to attend anger management classes. Again, psychology professor Carrie Keating. It is a big problem in this country. Men create more damage, but women hit more than men do. Every year, there are more than 800,000 serious cases of women abusing men. Again, nothing, 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 nothing. But confronted with this, what will people do when hidden cameras are rolling and our actress is out of control? No. Huh? One after another, people pass by and keep right on going. What will this woman do? At first, she seems to ignore the fight but pauses a few paces down the path to watch. She tells us she didn't think this woman could pose any real physical threat. It didn't look like any harm was being done. I, I didn't immediately think to protect the man at all. <laughs> but now we're about to meet a woman whose reaction is instant, visceral. Watch closely. No, get up. No. Watch it calm down. What went through her mind? Good for her. You go, girl. <laughs> Linda McCluthy just assumed he had it coming to him. But why? Maybe she caught him cheating or something like that, really bad, and that made her lose it. <laughs> We've seen it before, back when we taped our first experiment with that abusive boyfriend. We told our actors to trade places for just one take. Tell me right now, why? Why? and later brought bystanders together to talk about what they'd seen. My first thought was that he must have cheated on her. But you don't know that. <laughs> you don't, but... You look guilty. Exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and now, over and over again, when the victim is a man, so many women perceive him as guilty. I figure, well, he probably deserved it. Linda seems to think our feisty actress is a kind of role model. I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm pretty nice all the time. I should, I should have done what she did sometimes. But what about this guy? You know what, just, just, Nate, come on! Come on, what? Whose side what is he on? You haven't said a freaking word to me about it. We watch and record for hours and hours as 163 people just walk or jog right by. Look at how many people went by without defending that guy. And this is kind of classic because female aggression is usually seen as not very important, not very deadly, nothing really to react to. But just maybe things are about to change. Watch these women as they gather at a safe distance and map out a strategy. Now one of them approaches. Excuse me? Everyone wants to call the cops. <laughs> You're not gonna say anything? It's actually like none of your business, so can you excuse me? Oh sorry. Well if you need help, we'll help. But when she retreats, they go at it again. Look at me. Nate, stop ignoring me! What the, you're not even, look, Nate, hello, hello! And that's all it takes. Hello. This woman calls 911. 911, where's your brother to? It's two people 
people fighting on a bench. He's like beating them up. I was wondering if somebody could come just check it out. But what would a cop do when a woman is abusing a man? Self-centered. Ah. Hi guys. Why not call nine one one? What they would have it, they would just have a little tiff. It'd be alright. I find it upsetting. I would find it more upsetting if he were putting his hands on her. If you're wondering why they didn't call nine one one, well, he's a cop. If it had been the man, oh, without a doubt, you would have stepped in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's called old-fashioned views. It's, called, a, it's a double standard. It is. Well, what can I tell you? I mean, you know, if you're raised the way I was raised, you don't put your hands on it, right? So, what should you do if you watch, see something like that? Every individual has to do their own calculus when it comes to whether or not they should step in and help. For these women, the calculus was simple. The physical abuse, the verbal abuse, you know, you shouldn't be hitting one another. I was concerned for both their safety. And these women tell us the fact that the abuser is a woman makes no difference. That is not an answer! What matters is that someone needed help. There's also a risk to not helping. And when we fail to help in a situation, it doesn't make us feel very good about ourselves. I'd rather do the right thing than walk away and go home and regret it. Tonight, we celebrate artists whose music and message help shape our culture. And together, we can change our culture for the better by ending violence against women and girls. Artists have a unique power to change minds and attitudes. Ending violence against women and girls. 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 Megan! F you, you f You fucking f you. Megan! F you! Megan! Come home! Megan! Shut your fucking mouth, you f Come home! F you! you.
So you just, you didn't do anything wrong here? I don't feel like I did, no. I mean, he took, you know, my... He took my love and the vows that I made to him when we got married and totally tromped all over that for the first year of our marriage. Disrespected me, disrespected my home, disrespected our marriage. Okay, I understand why you feel justified for putting and him in jail. I'm just asking if you ran a red light in putting him in jail. Did you make statements that weren't true? I may have said that there was, there was punching or hitting and, and there, was, there was not that to my, to my recollection, well, recollection you, you but there was... You didn't maybe say it. You either said it or you didn't. You either said he hit me and punched me or you didn't. Did I, you I say did. It? You did. I did. And did he hit you and punch you? No. Okay. Not to my recollection. You knew it wasn't true when you said it, though. I mean, let's be honest. Yes. You, you knew it wasn't true when you said it, right? Yes. So you made a conscious decision to embellish the story. And that's a lie. I'm not saying this isn't the biggest creep in the world and you shouldn't divorce him before dark today. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that he's not mentally abusive, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, and even physically abusive. He may be, he may deserve yes. to be under the jail. I, I, what if, I'm not saying that you should put up with that at all under any theory whatsoever. What I'm asking you is did you or did you not file a false police report when you said that he punched you and hit you and you knew at the time that he did not? Yes. Okay. So this is a long way of coming around to saying, yeah, I lied to the police and got put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do that again if I, I could did. track you down again? If I can find you again? If I did. Sit there. Stop. Sit there. Stop. Sit there. That really hurts. Stop. We've seen what people do when a woman is abused by a man. Stop. Sit there. Stop. Sit there. You look like a psychotic person. But we wondered, what would happen if we reversed the sexes? What if the victim were a man and the abuser a woman? You want to start with me? This time, she plays the aggressor, verbally and physically abusing her boyfriend. How's that? How's that? Women abusing, even assaulting their male partners. Not as isolated as you might think. I hate you! From Moonstruck to Shakespeare in Love to Pirates of the Caribbean, women hitting men may be a Hollywood staple. But it's not just in the movies. Major League pitcher Chuck Finley's wife, actress Tawny Katan, was arrested and briefly jailed after he accused her of pummeling him. She denied it and charges were dropped, but only after she agreed to attend anger management classes. Again, psychology professor Carrie Keating. It is a big problem in this country. Men create more damage, but women hit more than men do. Every year, there are more than 800,000 serious cases of women abusing men. Again, nothing, 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 nothing. But confronted with this, what will people do when hidden cameras are rolling and our actress is out of control? No. Huh? One after another, people pass by and keep right on going. What will this woman do? At first, she seems to ignore the fight but pauses a few paces down the path to watch. She tells us she didn't think this woman could pose any real physical threat. It didn't look like any harm was being done. I, I didn't immediately think to protect the man at all. <laughs> but now we're about to meet a woman whose reaction is instant, visceral. Watch closely. No, get up. No. Watch it calm down. What went through her mind? Good for her. You go, girl. <laughs> Linda McCluthy just assumed he had it coming to him. But why? Maybe she caught him cheating or something like that, really bad, and then made her lose it. <laughs> We've seen it before, back when we taped our first experiment with that abusive boyfriend. We told our actors to trade places for just one take. Tell me right now, right. why? Why? And later brought bystanders together to talk about what they'd seen. 
Okay. My first thought was that he must have cheated on her. <laughs> I was just thinking that same thing. But you I don't mean, know that. I, you don't, but <laughs> you look guilty. Exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And now, over and over again, when the victim is a man, so many women perceive him as guilty. I figure, well, he probably deserved it. Linda seems to think our feisty actress is a kind of role model. I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm pretty nice all the time. I should, I should have <laughs> done what she did sometimes. But what about this guy? You know what, just, just, Nate, come on! Come on, what? Whose side is he on? You haven't said a freaking word to me about it. We watch and record for hours and hours as 163 people just walk or jog right by. Look at how many people went by without defending that guy. And this is kind of classic because female aggression is usually seen as not very important, not very deadly, nothing really to react to. But just maybe things are about to change. Watch these women as they gather at a safe distance and map out a strategy. Now one of them approaches. Excuse me? Everyone wants to call the cops. <laughs> You're not going to say anything? It's actually like none of your business, so can you excuse me? Oh, sorry. Well, if you need help, we'll help. But when she retreats, they go at it again. Look at me. Nate, stop ignoring me! What the, you're not even, look, Nate, hello, hello! And that's all it takes. Hello. This woman it's calls 911. 911, where's your murder to? There's two people fighting on a bench. She's like beating him up. I was wondering if somebody could come just check it out. But what would a cop do when a woman is abusing a man? Self-centered. Uh. Hi, guys. Why not call 911? Uh, what they would have, they would just have a little tiff. It'd be alright. I'd find it upsetting. I would find it more upsetting if he were putting his hands on her. Really? If you're wondering why they didn't call 911, well, he's a cop. What I saw, I if it had been the man, oh, without a doubt, you would have stepped in. Yeah. It's, it's, old, it's called old fashioned views. It's, it's a double but standard. It, it is. What can I tell you? I mean, you know, if you're raised the way I was raised, you don't put your hands on it, right? So what should you do if you watch, see something like that? Every individual has to do their own calculus when it comes to whether or not they should step in and help. For these women, the calculus was simple. The physical abuse, the verbal abuse, you know, you shouldn't be hitting one another. I was concerned for both their safety. And these women tell us the fact that the abuser is a woman makes no difference. That is not an answer! What matters is that someone needed help. There's also a risk to not helping. And when we fail to help in a situation, it doesn't make us feel very good about ourselves. I'd rather do the right thing than walk away and go home and regret it. In every metric that is of vital importance to humans, such as life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the right to reproduce, the right to raise our offspring. In all of these categories, men fall woefully behind women. It is not even close. Life expectancy in every nation on earth is lower for men than women, usually by as much as a decade. The incarceration rates across the world, and especially in America, hover near 100% male. More than seven out of every 10 suicide victims we bury are male. We are removing our men from society in an ever-increasing number. We are getting our asses handed to us and we do not even realize there's a fight going on. We are acting as though everything is normal. We are acting like we are thankful for losing. 96% of work-related deaths are men. Men make up 94% of all combat-related deaths. In America, women can join the military if they want to. They have a choice. Men must sign up for a selective service, meaning if the government wants to send us to war, we have no choice. Men must sign up for the draft at 18 or they face losing their citizenship. And the women who do choose to join the military never have to worry about being called into combat. 
Men are getting beat in education, too. Women have made up the majority of college students over the past decades, and the gender disparity in colleges is increasing every year. Boys are being targeted for mental illnesses and put on drugs in our schools. Boys make up 75% of children on prescribed psychoactive drugs in America. We are drugging our sons by the millions. Millions of infant boys are circumcised every year in America without any anesthesia. Circumcision is genital mutilation. Circumcision is the very definition of genital mutilation. Yet, in America, while it is a federal crime to genitally mutilate a female, it is a common practice to do it to males. It is a choice. We choose to cut the genitalia of our infant sons. Sex crimes, an almost exclusively male-punished crime, is sentenced more harshly than women who murder. On average, a man who is caught with digital pictures on his computer will be sentenced more harshly than a woman who murders her own baby. People wonder why the Catholic priests were able to get away with so much unpunished child molestation, and it was because it was mainly male victims. If it were female victims, we would have stormed the cathedrals with armed SWAT. Male victims of female sexual abuse especially in positions of abuse of power such as teachers, are said to be lucky. A man such as a teacher who molests young girls are lucky to not be dragged into the town square and lynched. Women who molest young boys are handled with kid gloves, and the male victim must hear constantly about how lucky he was to be molested. $20 billion a year is transferred from men to women in the form of what is ironically called child support. That is a larger amount than most giant corporations like Nike, the NFL, McDonald's make in a year. This transfer of money is enforced at the point of a gun. It is a federal and a state crime in every state to fail to pay child support. Tens of thousands of men are locked up every year because they cannot afford to pay child support. We have given the state and our women an incentive to separate us from our children. We are having our children taken from us by force and made to pay money to the state under threat of incarceration for being fathers. Being a father can make you a criminal. Men are vilified mocked, and beaten for entertainment. I challenge, nay, I dare anyone to watch a week of entertainment and count the amount of times that a non-villain hits the member of the opposite sex or threatens violence. I say non-villain because as a method of proving how evil a character is, doing things like kicking puppies or slapping women is proof of villainy. Now, I guarantee you that you will be hard-pressed to find any evidence of men hitting women, but you will find a disturbing amount of women hitting men. It is not only acceptable in our culture, but it is a form of entertainment and comedy at times. Kind of like how we joke about men in prison dropping the soap, yet cannot even mention female rape without having to trigger warn women for their delicate sensitivities. Oh, if you want to know who is in charge, look at who you cannot mock. Yet, even though men make up the vast number of homicide victims, suicide victims, the homeless, the incarcerated, males make up the vast number of those who die at work, die at war, and die by crime, and even though men make up the vast number of those depicted as evil in the media, boys make up the vast number of genitally mutilated children, and boys make up the vast number of drug children, and even though males die earlier than women, even though we know all of these things, still, the greatest amount of help, services, and support go to women. Instead of having a serious discussion on why we need to stop such a barbaric practice as slicing, or at times biting, the skin off of our son's genitalia, 
we are discussing why women are not making more money. How horrendous is it that women who do none of the dangerous low prestige jobs and most often work in very comfortable environments with good benefits want more money? To them, that is an issue that is much more vital than surgically altering our young boy's genitalia. Every study done has shown that each person on earth has a limit on the amount of concern they can show different things. Concern is not an inexhaustible supply. Our tank of concern is actually pretty small. What takes up more concern and attention in one thing takes away concern from another. What we choose to focus on is a good indicator of what we care about. Caring about grown women more than infant boys is very telling. Men are losing. This war was started a long time ago and we did not even know. Women make up a very small fraction of victims of violent crime, yet we have a national campaign to end violence against women. Due to the Violence Against Women Act, females are a protected class in America. The punishment vetted out by the justice system will mandatorily be more harsh if you assault a woman than if you had assaulted a male. Even though they have protected class status and they make up a very small fraction of the victims of violence, it is still a well-funded and highly talked about subject. It is almost as though women are all that matters, as though women are special and needed to be treated as such. I have never seen a national debate about violence against men. It is almost as though nobody cares about men. And that is because it's true. Nobody cares about men, not even other men. We have all been told since birth that the order of importance is women, then children, then men. Women and children first has been a societal mantra for generations. Treating people with equality by definition means not treating one group as more special than another better than. In all surveys, women are happier with life than men. Yet we constantly ignore men and focus all of our resources and attention on women. This needs to change. It is time to start taking care of each other, helping each other. This is a fight and it is a time that we start working together to win. We need to get medics to those who are wounded, artillery to those who are already in the midst of battle, air support to those that are locked down, or rations to those who are in need. This is a fight for our sons. This is a fight for our brothers. This is a fight for our fathers. Men, it is now time to fight back. It is now time for us to stand up for ourselves. It is now time to end this killing of men, this vilification of men, this removing men from their children, this society that cares nothing for men. Let's rise up and be proud, men. It is time. Subscribe to this channel and start the process. In this segment, we're going to look at some of the ways dangerous women are prepared to trick a man into marrying her. Women who are serious or desperate to find a husband invariably learn about a book that boasts sales of more than a million copies. It's called The Rules. If your girlfriend is in possession of this book, watch out. You're possibly what the authors describe as live prey. In fact, the authors also suggest quite strongly that this is a book that should be kept out of sight. This is why, because she may adopt the following tactics. She will never say or show that getting married is on her mind, even when it is. She rarely, if ever, calls you or even returns your calls. She wants you to do all the running to make it look as though she doesn't need you or even want you. 
she wants you to think of her as a challenge. Then further down the line, when you've put so much effort into winning her, you'll then be less likely to dump her. She's taught to make sure that whenever you're on the phone together, she will be the person who always ends the conversation. She always wants to leave you hungry for more. She makes a point of not answering your phone to you to create the impression that she's too busy or is in such demand from other men. This might not be at all true, but she wants you to think other men want her. The authors believe that most men will fight harder to win a girl if they think they've got competition. Part of that is about her deliberately appearing to be emotionally cool towards you. She's also encouraged not to show she's jealous or insecure. She's told to never appear needy, even though she might be an extremely needy individual. She's advised to never ask you where you've been or who you've been seeing. This helps her perpetuate the appearance that she's not being that bothered. She always acts as if everything is great, even if it isn't. In fact, she's told to always look and sound happy and upbeat, even if it's an act. She will also act to look as though she's independent, so that you don't feel as though she's expecting you to look after her and care for her, even though that is her objective. She won't agree to see you more than twice a week. She may claim that she's not available, even if she is. She's told that she must never accept an invitation for a weekend date if you ask her after a Wednesday of that week. She doesn't want you to think that she can be called last minute, and she'll say yes. She learns to gently insist that you have to arrange your schedule around her. A girl who's read this book is also told to never have sex with a guy until at least after three dates. She's told to dump any guy who hasn't, doesn't give her expensive romantic presents for her birthday. She's also advised not to live with you or even leave her things at your place. She wants to condition you into thinking that if you want to see her seven days a week, you have to marry her. If you're in a long-term relationship with a girl who wants to get married, she may claim that she's pregnant. Now, this is sometimes just to see how you respond. I mean, genuine accidents happen, of course. But if it does happen, calmly ask her how she feels about it. When, not if she asks you how it makes you feel, tell her that you want children only when they're planned. If she pushes you in to tell her what she should do about it, if she's pregnant, don't be drawn on that. If she's manipulating you, that is the trap. Politely and considerately say you're prepared to sit down to discuss it properly if or when a pregnancy test proves positive. As if the prevalence of sexually transmitted disease weren't enough, accidental pregnancy is a key reason to always use a condom when having sex with a single woman who may want children when you don't. Particularly unscrupulous and dangerous women will deliberately get themselves pregnant if they suspect that their boyfriend will do the honorable thing and then ask her to marry him. A lot of men do. Now, if any girl exhibits a combination of any of these behaviors, she's almost certainly working on you. So be very careful. The book I've been talking about has been described as an approach to manipulate an unsuspecting man into committing himself to a marriage that he thinks was all his own idea. The authors claim that if you follow their rules, the reader can be rest assured that her husband will treat her like a queen even when he's angry with her because he invested so much time and effort into getting her in the first place. The authors also claim that when women follow their recommendations, their approach has led to countless happy marriages. What they don't share is how many marriages they've helped to start that have resulted in misery for everyone, including any children who were produced by this deceitful scheming. Nor do they say whether such an outcome would be in the best interests of any man who is duped by a woman so desperate to get married that she'd resort to this type of behavior. The book says, if you're a genuinely nice person, you'll probably feel cruel when you do the rules. You may think that you're making men suffer, but in reality, you're actually doing them a favor. To the authors, playing games is not bad. 
What seems to say it all to me, though, is how they beseech their readers not to tell their therapist about the book, because the therapist may just believe that such an approach is a manipulative, deceitful and dishonest way to trap a man into marriage. Surely not. Hi, everybody. I'm Girl Writes What? And uh, uh, an online friend of mine was uh, really freaking pissed off after reading a recent effort on the part of, I can only assume, is a traditionalist woman in uh, trying to figure out what the heck is wrong with men these days. I'm, I'm going to leave the article in the information section along with uh, some other stuff. But uh, basically, just like many traditionalists and feminists before her, she, she really missed the mark by a freaking mile. Um, even though she really, she kind of danced a little closer, like within a hundred miles or so of the, the few core issues that currently discourage men from being the good little married drones they're supposed to be. Despite being critical of feminist attitudes that she rightly sees as anti-male, the article was still absurdly gynocentric. It was very much about what women want and uh, why they're not getting it. And, uh, like, that is getting married, having babies on women's schedules as decided by women. Um, I almost have to wonder whether this author even bothered to ask any actual unmarried males why they're refusing or not bothering to uh, man up before writing her article. But, as I said, it at least poked at the surface of the festering boil that is the systemic nature of the problem, even if it didn't give it the lancing it truly deserved. Her conclusion seemed to come down to why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free, uh, and why get a good job when women are independent and can just give milk away for nothing. Um, both are backhanded criticisms of women's behavior, which is kind of nice, somebody brave enough to blame women for their own troubles, but, but they really fall far short of any real examination of the underlying issues. So, I'm going to give it the old college try and uh, give a bit of an overview of what I believe has become a multifaceted problem. Now, I'm going to read a recent, uh, part of a recent article from Hartiste, uh, who said a very great deal with some serious literary flair, uh, it's kind of pearls of wisdom from the pit of social nihilism that is the pickup artist community. And, uh, and he actually was spot on about some things, yet, again, overly simplistic about others. I'm just going to quote some of the relevant, relevant bits and leave a link to the article below. He says, If you want to know why men are running away from marriage, children, and beta provisioning, one major reason is that the women available to these working-class men are flat-out disgusting. What man of normal mental health and active libido wants to romantically woo and date, let alone marry, a beastly, waddling, tatted mountain of pustulence with the issue of three other men barking and nipping at her cankles? And let's not forget that economically empowered and government-assisted women, slaves to their hypergamous instincts for a higher-status mate than themselves, cannot help but winnow the pool of men deemed acceptable marriage material. When women say, there are no good men left, what the astute observer hears is, there are no good men left thanks to a combination of my increased expectations and decreased attractiveness. He goes on to say, to the factory farm tower, ivory tower sociologists studying marriage trends and turning out paper after paper of half-assed hogwash, there's a whole other world out there. It's the world of men, and in that world, men's desires matter. You should think about incorporating that ugly reality into your theories. As blistering as that little snippet was, it raises some very important points, and I think the most important one is that men's desires matter. When men can't find women they desire who are willing to partner with them, then why would they partner? And, uh, and it really can't be stressed enough. Uh, that the reality of divorce and family law in our culture plays a huge part in men's growing contempt for marriage as an institution. It's not that men are commitment phobes. It's that women seem increasingly commitment incompatible. The word commitment has, in fact, in female parlance, come to mean 
up until the moment I'm no longer 100% satisfied with the person I married. And that attitude's only going to lead to more and more divorces as more and more successful women effectively set their sights higher than they reasonably should while their youth and attractiveness wanes, leading to a growing number of them feeling like they settled even if they didn't, even if they scored someone two points above them on the overall attractiveness scale. One symptom of this, I think, uh, that's very telling is OkCupid's recent revelation that women on their site deemed 80% of men less than average attractiveness. That is, 80% of men were below average. This does not compute. This in no way is in line with reality. This is about women's expectations. And oddly enough, no one, least of all women, seem to really give a shit what men want in a partner. Why can't men just be happy with what's available? Well, when you look at what's available to the average man in his 30s or early 40s, a 35-year-old woman who hollers yes over the jangling of her biological clock while unable to keep the grimace from her face because he's a bigger loser than the five guys she dumped in her 20s and now she's having to settle. Or a divorcee who's already financially annihilated and emotionally crippled at least one other man. Or uh, a single mother who's collecting reams of child support from one poor schmuck while well, her other baby daddy manages to duck his obligations because he's a drug dealer and his income's off the books. And yeah, I'm exaggerating, but you see my point. And no, not all women are like that. Lord knows, I know not all women are like that. But frankly, the consensus among today's women seems to be that this state of affairs is just the new normal. Uh, even responsible women will often frame such destructive choices on the part of other women as somehow valid and defensible. The sentiment in the mainstream is that men should just man up and go along with pairing up 2.0, who cares what men want, and that essentially a woman's behavior and life choices should have no effect on whether she's able to attract a good, reliable man. All of that really doesn't speak well of the principles of even those women who are more well-situated. In fact, I think it's safe to say that the fewer female voices of reason there are out there, the more men are likely to wash their hands of the entire idea of partnering. But I honestly think it goes even deeper than just the baggage the average unattached woman now carries or the danger of ending up an emotionally and financially devastated statistic with generous every other weekend access to one's children that's keeping men from manning up. I kind of started thinking a little bit more about this when I uh, watched Typhon Blue's uh, extremely thought-provoking video uh, on what she calls the apexual male, a man who, uh, who does not identify with other men. Uh, but merely identifies with his place in the status hierarchy. I, I highly recommend anybody to go watching, go watch that, and, and I'm going to leave the link in the information section as well. Her video got me thinking about the White Feather Girls. For those of you who don't know, this was a group of young women in the UK during World War I who went around bestowing white feathers of cowardice on any man they saw in civilian clothes to shame them into enlisting. Now, when I consider how vulnerable so many men were to those kinds of shaming tactics, vulnerable enough to enlist in a war that killed 10 million uh, to preserve their manhood in the eyes of bitchy women they'd never even met, I just can't believe that it's only the risks of marriage, as onerous as they are, that have rendered men impervious to the kinds of shaming tactics employed by traditionalists and feminists who seem increasingly desperate to strong-arm men back into their old roles. So I think beyond any discussion of the risks of marriage, unfairness in family court, all of that, I think way down at the, at the core of things, uh, maybe it's about uh, a positive male identity. Now, male identity almost always re revolves around doing rather than being. Uh, most of that doing has revolved around being of use in a uniquely male context. 
Most of men's usefulness through history has derived from learning male skills and performing them well, embodying a male role in the service of women and society. In the more turbulent past, those roles uh, needed to perform a valuable service to women or the community that women couldn't or shouldn't be expected to perform for themselves. Now, this is the most common path, in my opinion, to a positive male identity, because men lack a mechanism for automatic own group preference. Simply put, they just don't relate to other men automatically, just because they're men. Women have this bias, which provides them a natural ability to form cooperatives and relate to other women and seek consensus through their strong mechanism for own group preference based on gender alone. Um, given the gender roles through most of human history, this mechanism really makes sense. Uh, their individual value as, to put it bluntly, breeders, meant that in a survivalist environment, you didn't throw a woman on the trash pile without a pr pressing reason. Adjustments were made when they could be to keep as many women as possible within the sisterhood. This is where you'll find a ton of attention in female spaces given to things like tone and being nice and you know, emoticons with smiling faces and getting along even when there are disagreements. Uh, a lot of their interactions are about comfort level and feelings of acceptance. Men on the other hand, lack the hardwiring to form a preference for maleness based merely on maleness. And that really just makes sense when you think about men's roles for the last couple million years or so. Um, roles that involve things like beating the men down the valley to a pulp when they threatened his women and children, or competing against other males within his community for a shot at the mating game. Given those roles, automatically siding with one's own gender over the other is just not going to work. And it's not that men can't manifest any forms of own group preference. It's just that when own group preference manifests in males, it, it just isn't based on maleness alone. There has to be a common purpose, a common set of ideals or principles, a common duty or cause, a common doing, or a common position in the status hierarchy. So men can indeed identify with each other and relate to each other and be team players among other men. Uh, you see it in churches, military units, fraternities, sports teams, even sports fans, political parties, movements, project teams, stuff like that. And while they'll often form hierarchies within those contexts, those realms can be sources of a sense of loyalty and brotherhood among men. The myth among feminists that men will insult each other for displaying feminine traits because they see women as inferior is really just that, a myth. Uh, men do this because women have a trump card that they don't, a trump card that bestows intrinsic value on them, their uteruses, and they retain that value even when they gender bend a little. A woman who acts like a woman isn't seen as inferior at all. A man who acts like a woman uh, has always been seen not as a woman, but as a woman without a womb. That is, a woman with no value. He has no female value, and he has no unique male value, therefore he has no value at all. And unlike women who, uh, who were valuable in and of themselves, men who were not useful did, and still do, get thrown onto the trash heap of society. In the currency of reproduction, an ovum might go for a thousand bucks, a uterus, a cool mill, an ejaculation, that's worth about ten cents. To be acceptable mating material and worth a community keeping him around, a man had to do more than generate sperm. And when the only thing keeping you from becoming completely disposable as an individual lies in differentiating yourself from the feminine to spare women those onerous tasks, well, guys are going to enforce that shit. It's my belief that this is why men have always tended to define themselves by their roles. Father, husband, working man, soldier, career man, family man, middle class man, politician, activist, all of that. In other words, roles to exist in which allow them to relate to other men who also occupy those roles and to derive a positive and meaningful identity from performing their masculinity through those roles. And I also think this may be why suicide rates for men skyrocket after divorce. 
you haven't just taken away his kids, his wife, his assets, and, and a good chunk of his income. You've effectively stripped him of a huge part of the male identity he's built around himself. So, I'm thinking that for most men, forming a positive male identity in relation to other males requires a couple of things. Uh, a male role that's differentiated from the female one, or at the very least a male-oriented environment, and, well, positivity. Men used to be able to construct a positive male identity out of marriage. That is, through the respected and uniquely male role of husband and father. When that identity is increasingly characterized by society as superfluous, obsolete, or in the words of Harriet Harman, unnecessary to social cohesion, it's no longer a way for a man to defer his disposability, is it? Moreover, when that identity can be unilaterally stripped from him on the whim of, of his wife, even when he did everything right, marriage ceases to be a positive way for men to define themselves as men. It really becomes a way for men to define themselves as chumps and idiots, and nobody really wants to define themselves that way. Moreover, from sitcoms to rom-coms to TV commercials to billboard ads, the role of husband and father is increasingly one of playing the incompetent buffoon to sassy, smart, together, disrespectful wife or even child. In the mass media, there's nothing noble or respectable about husbandhood or fatherhood anymore. And when the roles within the marriage uh, have become virtually indistinguishable and interchangeable, a man's role becomes less and less male. It's just a role. Um, it can be a path to meaning and fulfillment if he's lucky, and it, it may be something he desires to do and to become, but it's not a necessarily a path to defining himself as a man. So we can scratch that one off the list, even for men who've been living under a rock when it comes to divorce law. Marriage and children no longer offer a reliable path to a positive male identity. It's no longer positive, nor is it significantly male. The workplace is yet another milieu that has largely lost its maleness. And that's not to say that women ruined everything. It's not so much the presence of women, but rather the alterations in environment and interaction many women demand when they want to engage the world through the paid workforce. A male space that leads to a positive male identity doesn't need to be free of women, but it needs to be male. Uh, it needs to be an environment that suits their psychology, not one in which they end up being metaphorically castrated if they want to steer clear of trouble with human resources. And I'm not even talking about vulgarity or expressions of sexuality. I'm talking about things like aggression, ambition, ribbing, competition, passion, authority, plain speech. All of these are often discouraged when women are present in order to spare feelings and prevent discomfort. Outspokenness is replaced with drawing room rules of discourse and ingenuity with protocol, all of which render a feminized workplace, though tolerable to men, no longer a path to a positive male identity. It's no longer a male space, and it no longer appeals to the psychology of men. The workplace has therefore become a ladder fewer men feel driven to climb in order to construct their identities. Combine this with the fact that uh, their job is frequently on the line the moment they step out of the rigid, rigid uh, restrictions on their masculinity um, and offend an, an overly litigious female coworker. A large number of men are not only becoming disenchanted with the expectation to perform in an environment that doesn't feed their nature and has set them up to fail, uh, and that sees him as disposable, in the absence of those uniquely male-centered psychological rewards and motivators, a growing number of them are finally opening their eyes and waking up to the negative aspects of wage slavery. And that is a pill that, once taken, can't be unswallowed. In every single space, males congregate where women have elbowed their way in and demanded changes. You seem to find large numbers of men just kind of giving ground and eventually losing their drive to really perform there. And, and again, I don't think it's the presence of women that does this. It's the enforced necessity to change one's behavior in order to maintain a proper decorum around them, and the changes in how those places function 
that women often demand. It's the expectation that the environment and the men in it should adjust to suit women's needs, rather than expecting women to adjust themselves to that environment. A few bastions of maleness remain, places where women are often welcome right up until they begin to demand the environment change to suit them, at which point you'll begin hearing a lot of male protest. I can even see this tolerance on the part of men when, say, a woman sneaks into the men's room because the lineup's too long at the ladies' room. Everything's fine, unless she suddenly takes offense at men behaving the way men do in a restroom by farting and pissing in her presence. So, where are men retreating to? They're retreating to the internet and the few men's spaces that haven't tailored their rules of conduct to suit women's easily offended natures and need for comfort. They're retreating to the MRM, where a common set of ideals and values bonds the community and allows them to define their maleness irrespective of society's or women's approval, a place where words and ideas are more important than the tone or the smiles that may or may not lie behind them. They're retreating to the hierarchy and uniquely male objectives of the pickup artist community, where competition and scorekeeping are indeed still allowed, even encouraged, and where there are men for others to admire or to mentor, where they thumb their noses at women, what women say they want. Society was not working for those guys, so they invented their own society, and they're running with it by their own rules. Y you see it in comics and video games and those related forums, online venues where refusals to police speech are usually deemed misogyny, and the men there just don't really give much of a fuck. You see this in men going their own way, who've taken a stand based on a realistic assessment of what's in it for them, and who maintain their self-respect not by complying with society's expectations, but by disregarding them. And you see it in the beer buddies, hookup, and Xbox culture. Part-time jobs men tolerate but don't care about. And you really see it in the gynocentrism of manginas and white knights who supplicate and pander to the feminine even when it's ugly or amoral, differentiating themselves from the feminine through their blind worship of it. And why? Because all of the approved paths to a positive male identity, the paths society both endorses and depends on, are gone. Even when men don't consciously realize it, they, they know it somewhere in the backs of their brains. Men have always been willing to work and sacrifice and sweat and bleed if they were rewarded with a means through which to see themselves as worthy of respect. But when every single role society wants to cram you into is no longer a way to respect yourself or have the respect of others, then it's really time to throw those roles away. And one thing that Typhon Blue's apexuals at the top of society, like Bill Bennett and uh, Obama, feminists like Kay Heimowitz and Katie Roythe, the traditionalists like Suzanne Venker, one thing they're never going to realize is that using shame to try to coerce men to do what is expected of them isn't going to work this time. Because while it's possible to shame a man into giving his life for his country if there's a promise of respect in it, it's impossible to shame someone into working his ass off and risking his whole future just for the joy of looking in the mirror and seeing Homer Simpson or Ray Barone or Dilbert looking back at him. When the cost of society's approval is the self-respect you derive from a positive identity, it ceases to be worth it to a lot of men. Anyhow, those are my ideas. Um, these are just things that I've been thinking about, and, uh, and I don't, absolutely do not think that they are written in stone. If anybody has any, um, anything to add or any criticisms of my assessment here, um, I will happily entertain them in the comments. And, uh, I guess I will see you all again later.